Good morning. Good to see you today. And, uh, you know, really, I said, thinking about April, a couple of observations. The uh, flowering trees have been amazing uh, this April. The colors have been so vivid and amazing. And it's also a month in which whatever weather you like, you're getting. Sometimes in the same day. It can be winter, spring, summer, and fall all in the same day. And, and so just a, an interesting month. But uh, flowers are blooming. The trees look amazing. And God's uh, display of new life is everywhere around us. And certainly that's what he does for us through Christ Jesus. It's good to have you here this morning as we come together to worship, as to pray, to praise, and to, to be revived. Uh, as I've often said, the, the church is a hospital for sinners or a fueling station for us to be recharged and energized, equipped to, to go out into the world to share the good news of Christ Jesus in a lost and hurting world. Uh, let's see, uh, on uh, May 19th, Bishop Randy Sizemore will be here bringing the message, so you want to stay tuned for that. Um, this week, uh, we have our governing board meeting tomorrow night at 7 p.m. We have our Fun and Faith Kids Club Wednesday, 6.30 to 7.30. Uh, on Thursday morning at 9, we have our Mifflin Community Food Ministry. And we have our Bible study at 7 o'clock Thursday night on Zoom. Uh, we are in Genesis 49 this coming week. Uh, on Saturday, uh, the Pairs and Spares retreat will take place in the Fellowship Hall from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. Uh, the altar flowers are presented to the glory of God in honor of the 15th wedding anniversary of Marsha and Doug Sewell. Happy anniversary. When is the, the actual day? The second. All right. Very good. 15 years. Congratulations. Uh, the bulletins presented the glory of God in honor of the birthday of our dad, Steve Brendel, on the 30th by Jacob, Mackenzie, Kaylin, and Ethan. Happy birthday, Steve. Our ushers were Glenn and David Worley. Our greeters were Carol and Glenn and Worley. The Worleys are really getting worked out today, I tell you. Um, thanks to everyone who helped move the furniture for the last two Sundays. We're, we're heading into ordinary time pretty soon. This is the fifth Sunday of Easter. Uh, we have the Ascension coming up, and then we will be in ordinary time. Uh, there's a list of pantry needs. Uh, a thank you to everyone that helped uh, at the Spring Fling Flock Party yesterday. Uh, Joan said everything went well. It was a little chilly, a little rainy, but everybody had a good time. Uh, dinner church, they had, I think Sue said, 42 last night, and things went well. Uh, our prayers and sympathies are extended uh, to the family of Scott Hewitt on the, his death this past week. Uh, graveside service is going to be on Monday. It is a private service. Um, make sure you get a copy of the newsletter uh, when you leave today. There's information about the Moton uh, Boy Scout troop uh, that's selling Wawa tickets uh, that are good for one shorty sandwich. It has no expiration date. The cost is six. If you're interested, you can see Keith Schmel. And uh, let's see. Next Sunday, we're going to start something new. Uh, one of the things that One of the things that we have done in the past before COVID, uh, the pandemic, is we would have a communion offering, and that offering would go to, to help uh, with our benevolent fund for people within the church occasionally if they have a problem with a bill they can't pay or something along those lines, we can help them with that. Well, we really don't take that communion offering like we did before COVID. So what we're going to do beginning in May, the first Sunday of the month, we're going to designate as a benevolent offering Sunday. Uh, if you're able to give something to the benevolent fund, uh, there will be envelopes available at both tables in the entrances. You can put your offering in there. That will uh, be part of your tithe statement as well. But that money will be used uh, directly for helping people in our care that we know. Uh, and uh, that we deal with. So if you're able to uh, be a part of that, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Doug Sewell. We have a profession of our church's faith and a call to worship this morning. Please join me in both. I believe that the Son of God, through his spirit and word, out of the entire human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, gathers, protects, and preserves for himself a community chosen for eternal life and united in true faith. 
and of this community, I am and always will be a living member. The communion of saints, believers one and all, as members of this community, share in Christ and in all his treasures and gifts. Each member should consider it a duty to use these gifts readily and joyfully for the service and enrichment of the other members. And now to the call to worship. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your power. All your works praise you, Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this uh, opportunity to gather today. It's our desire to grow in knowledge, faith, and love for you and for one another. We pray, Father, that you would feed us through your holy word, give us a greater desire to study and apply it into our lives and to share it with others. We pray that you would bless us, uh, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, give us that extra measure of your presence as we worship in faith, and uh, may all that we say and do be pleasing in your sight, for we ask this all in Jesus' precious name, amen. Our opening hymn today is hymn number four. It's in the Songs of Zion, though. It's in your white book, and uh, number four, it's entitled Knowing You. You can stand and join me. <laughs> All I want, how dear, build my life upon All this world reveres and wars to own All I want, thought, gain, I have counted lost Spent and worthless now compared to this knowing you Jesus knowing you there is no greater thing you're my all you're the best you're my joy my righteousness and I love you Lord now my heart's deep Desire is to know you more, to be found in you and known as yours, to possess by faith what I could not earn, all surpassing gift of righteousness. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you. There is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness. And I love you, Lord. Oh, to know the power of your risen life. And to know you in your suffering. To become like you in your death, my Lord, so with you to live and ever die. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best, you're my joy, my righteousness. And I love you, Lord, love you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We uh, have exceeded our goal for our rally day last Sunday, so praise God. Uh, I know that out of that uh, $6,000 plus, a 1000 
dollars was going to help with the student aid for our upcoming pastors, $1,000 to missions, $500 to the benevolent fund, and the remainder to help with the care and upgrades of the church facilities. So we thank you for everyone. Why I'm Missing Band did a great job last week, and I believe everyone was blessed through that. So we are are grateful for all that you do. It is making a difference, uh, not just here locally, but globally as we continue to share the good news of Jesus to a lost and fallen world in which we live. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift and the giver as we continue to lift up the name of Christ Jesus to a world of people that are lost in sin and in desperate need of a Savior. It's in our Savior's precious name that we pray. We pray, Father, that you would help us to be faithful with all that you have given, uh, that we could see the, the importance of working together for your cause in the world in which we live. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. As we go into our, our time of prayer, uh, we've received word that my predecessor, Pastor Jim Price, is still in the hospital. He had his gallbladder removed. He had gallstones, and uh, now he is suffering from pancreatitis. So we want to keep uh, uh, Jim and Kathy and the family in our prayers. Uh, I heard from uh, Jim that Rick Moore went to the emergency room this morning. Uh, Rick and Shirley generally sit in the men's fellowship classroom for church and uh, he's having uh, some chest issues. We're not sure if it's a heart or what's going on, but they're checking him out, so we want to keep uh, Rick in prayer. Uh, we know that Scott Hewitt uh, passed away last week. We want to continue to pray for uh, his family as they mourn his passing. Um, let's see, uh, Pastor Jerry Baum is having uh, uh, just a cold with a lot of coughing. Tell you, allergies are in high gear right now, so it doesn't surprise me. We want to keep uh, Pastor Jerry. We have Donna Fritz with us today, who's on the mend and here with us, so that's good to see. Uh, Sue Race is, is making progress. Uh, Shirley Potts, as far as I know, is still in Reading Rehab on you know, Paper Mill Road, so we want to keep uh, Shirley in prayer as she recovers from her broken hip and uh, they can get her back in shape to get her back home. Uh, a lot of other people on our prayer list, uh, people on our hearts and our minds, uh, really just a starting point. I often marvel at the, the, the people that God lays on my heart to, to pray for. Uh, a, a point in case is I was thinking of Edith Stauffer the other day, and uh, she is the lady that always would sit next to Shirley Potts. Uh, she is, I believe, about 93 years old and uh, just kind of lost track and... Um, I was uh, doing some visits in Mifflin Court, and that's where she's at now. And so we want to keep Edith in prayer as she gets acclimated to a new life at Mifflin Court, and uh, that God will bring healing to her situation and to ours as well. I believe there's power in our prayers as we call out to God in prayer. He not only hears, he understands, and he brings healing in his way and in his time. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your love and for your grace and for your son Jesus who has delivered us from sin and death. He has set us free from all that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and he has given us the ability to be called your children dearly loved by you. 
gaining all the rights and privileges of heaven in eternity one day. We pray, Father, for those on our prayer list. We uh, pray for, for Doug Young and for, for Ben Heckman and uh, for Jim Price and Rick Moore and uh, for each person there on our prayer list. We pray for the Hewitt family and for those that are mourning loved ones that they might find comfort in your presence, that they might find the assurance of life eternal through your son Jesus as Savior and Lord. We pray for our shut-ins and for our missionaries and the missions that we support. We pray, Father, for this congregation. We pray that you would bless Zion Evangelical that you would use us mightily for your kingdom, that you would enlarge our territory, that you would give us a desire and the ability to reach men and women, boys and girls, with the love and grace of Christ Jesus, that they might know him as Lord and Savior, that they might begin to live for him and find true life. And so, Father, bless us in this endeavor, and let us pray as Jesus taught the disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I have uh, heard uh, from George and Carol Stevens. Uh, they have moved towards Allentine, Allentown. They're living in a 50-plus community. And now that they've figured out how to use all the light switches and things in their house, they're very happy. Uh, they do miss us, though, and we miss them. But I just wanted to give you an update that uh, they are doing well in their new location. Uh, our uh, praise hymn today is hymn number 87 in your red hymnal, Fairest Lord Jesus, 87 in your Hymnal. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nations, O Thou God and man, the cherish thee will I honor thou my soul's glory joy and crown fair are the meadows fairer still the woodlands robed in the blue voice today. It is a blessing to sing the hymns of praise to God. And 
the, the lyrics are often a wonderful reminder of the scriptural truth of all that is ours in Christ Jesus. So I'm very grateful to make a joyful noise. Uh, Carol was suggesting that I should, uh, should sing to you guys. I, I don't think it's a good idea. Actually, as a pastor, it's my desire to bring people in, not to push them out. But uh, it, was, it was an idea. Not a good one, but it was an idea. Anyway. So good to be here with you today. Uh, our, our message today is proclaiming the good news. And, and really, it is a, a willingness to be used by God wherever you are. I've been fortunate as a, a, a serviceman in the Army. I traveled all over the world. I was able to spend time in third world countries. I was able to see just how blessed we truly are in this country. But I, I realize that no matter where we are, God can use us if we are sensitive to the nudging of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And, and so that's the key. Wherever we are, uh, we can prosper and grow, and we can be used by God if we're willing and if we're still sensitive to that still small voice of God. Could I have uh, someone offer a prayer for the message today, please? Amen. Thank you, Tammy. I appreciate that. I uh, was fortunate as a, uh, a young child uh, to go to a Billy Graham crusade at Three Rivers Stadium in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Billy Graham used to have these massive evangelistic gatherings. Thousands of people would come to hear the good news. Many would give their lives to Jesus. They would receive him as their Savior and Lord. And while mass evangelism has its place, it's not as uh, prominent today as it once was, in God's value system, it doesn't matter whether one is speaking to uh, thousands or hundreds or, or even just one person. You know, sometimes we have a divine appointment from God to share this good news with people that need to hear it. It's important that we are sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, our mission lived out by faith is to know Christ and to make Christ known. We need to be faithful of the nudging of the Holy Spirit in our lives to, to reach out to others sharing the good news of Christ Jesus. We need to be faithful to God's call in our life. It is a measure of uh, Christian maturity. And, and uh, honestly, I have struggled for years uh, worrying about what people might think or uh, in some cases, just having people shut me down right away saying, you know, that's good for you, but I don't want to hear it. But the truth of the matter is that every now and again, I come across somebody that is ready, ready to hear the good news, and they're ready to talk about it, and on and, and many occasions have been able to lead people to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so... We need to understand that we never know what's going on in somebody's life. We, we don't know what they're dealing with day to day. But we do need to trust God and, and the nudging of his spirit to be willing to share uh, our faith and what it means for us to have Jesus as Savior and Lord. I walk Sandy. I don't walk with a Bible. I have her leash in one hand, a bag of treats in another and I talk to people as I walk through the neighborhood, and uh, I listen, and I listen for an opening to something that's going on in their lives that I can say, well, you know, um, I believe that God can help us in these instances, and, and many times have an opportunity to, to pray with them or to, to lead them to maybe a greater understanding of, of what the Word of God has to say. But it starts with an honest conversation and a willingness to have a purpose, and that purpose is to share the good news of Christ Jesus in a lost and fallen world in which we live. Our uh, Bible reading comes from the book of Acts as we read about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch today. Philip was tra uh, traveling to many Samaritan villages to proclaim the good news of Christ Jesus. And his efforts were bearing fruit wherever he went. Uh, he, uh, he just felt this need to, to reach non-Jewish 
people with the good news. And he was doing so well in these Samaritan villages, which, by the way, the, the, those in Judaism hated Samaritans. They were half Jewish, they were half Gentile, and they were hated by the Jews, by and large. And so Philip is out of the box. He's listening to the calling of God in his life, and he's reaching those that many believe are unreachable. And his efforts are bearing so much fruit that Peter and John went out to see what all this was about. And God would reveal to them in time that he was for all people. It doesn't matter if you're black or white, rich or poor, where you live or where you don't live, what you have, what you don't have. All that matters is that God loves you so much that he sent his son into the world to deliver us from sin and death. Philip the Evangelist was one of the seven deacons uh, to serve in the Jerusalem church to oversee the food distribution to women. Stephen was part of that seven that uh, was in charge of this. Stephen had recently been martyred for his faith in Christ Jesus. It was during this time that Saul, who would become the Apostle Paul, was actively persecuting Christians for their faith in Jesus. And as a result, people were getting out of town, getting away from the persecution. But what they were finding is where they were was a great opportunity for them to share Jesus with a new people, a new generation. So Philip left Jerusalem. He became an evangelist in Samaria. After the church was started, he traveled from one village to another, sharing the good news that is found through faith in Christ Jesus. And from Samaria, Philip would be led by God to bring the gospel to this Ethiopian eunuch. This is where we pick up today in the, the book of Acts. Uh, uh, Luke is the author of his gospel as well as the book of Acts. We are in Acts uh, chapter 8 today, verses 26 to 40. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down the desert road that runs to Jerus from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning, Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. And the passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. And as they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? And he ordered the carriage to stop. And they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself further north at the town of Azotus. He preached the good news there and in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. I didn't realize that there are two Caesareas. This is why Bible study oftentimes can be problematic. There's a Caesarea by the sea and then there's the other Caesarea. The Caesarea by the sea is most likely the area that Philip would go and ultimately have a ministry for 20 years as he reached men and women, boys and girls, with the love and grace of Christ Jesus. You see, God is concerned for all people. It doesn't matter who we are, where we come from, what we've done, what we haven't done. God loves us so much. He created us in his image. He created us to know him, to love him, and to proclaim him. And uh, this uh, Ethiopian eunuch uh, accepted Christ through this conversation with Philip. So we see that all people have an opportunity to come to become a child of God through the proclamation of the good news. You know, in Acts 8, we read that uh, 
Jerusalem's Christians were scattered abroad to escape persecution. Everywhere they went, they preached. Wherever they were, they were at home to share Jesus with the people around them. Uh, the call is the same today. Uh, God calls people of faith to share the good news wherever we are. In, in your communities, in your workplace, in your home, in your schools, wherever you are, you have an opportunity. And we need to do that. We need to listen. We need to listen to what people are saying. People will be more than happy to tell you about their problems. I know because I have people tell me about their problems all the time. And I tell people about my problems all the time. But it's a great opportunity to say, well, you know, here's what God has done in my life in these situations. Uh, we know that uh, as Philip, you know, is gone, an angel of the Lord tells him, go south. You know, go to this deserted area. And this is a divine appointment from God. We know that angels are not leading people to the Lord, but they're prompting, God, uh, prompting others to do what God calls us to do. And he meets this treasurer of Ethiopia. This is a rich individual. Uh, he uh, is a eunuch, and he is the treasurer uh, under the authority of the Kandake. The Kandake is a title of the mother of the queen. And so he is uh, an important person, and uh, we know that he's important because he's riding in a carriage, if you will, or a chariot. Uh, most people, common class people of that day, they walked from place to place. For those that had a little bit of money, uh, perhaps they had a donkey, another animal that they could perhaps ride on. But people that had wealth and means rode in carriages in chariots. This man was an educated man. We have some clues in this passage about him. We know that he was coming from Jerusalem where he went to worship. We know that he traveled, he probably was from the Sudan, and he traveled from there to go to, to uh, Jerusalem to worship God. He had heard about God. He was curious about God. Uh, he probably had heard about Jesus uh, because of everything that had taken place in Jerusalem. And so he was ripe for the right conversation. And he just needed somebody to be where he was. And he was honest in, in the, the question, do you understand what you're reading? No. Is this about Isaiah or is this about someone else? Well, let me tell you about who this someone else is. And so Philip began to explain to him who Christ is, the Messiah, and uh, we know that he shared with this man that Jesus lived, that he died, that he rose again, that he ascended, and that he intercedes for us, us, and that you need Jesus as Lord and Savior. You, if you believe in God, this is how you come to God through his Son, uh, and we can uh, presuppose that he must have mentioned to this man about baptism, because we see that God supplies the need as it is there. You know, we who live by faith in Christ Jesus, we need to understand that we do not work alone or with human energy. Uh, matter of fact, we, uh, we work through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll be honest with you, there, there are times that I meet with people and I feel woefully inadequate. Honestly, I, I just feel, man, you really blew that. You had an opportunity, you should have said this, you should have said that. And, and just feel woefully inadequate. And every now and again, I connect with somebody and I can tell they're, they're ready. They're, they're ready to hear. They're hurting and they're looking and they're seeking and they, they need something. And what they, that something they need is Jesus. And it's an opportunity to share. You know, we need to understand that we're not working alone, that, that we're not doing this in our own energy. We're, we're doing this in the power of, of God and admonition of God that he provides for us. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 through 15, he said this, he said, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obey God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing, so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Well, Paul, that sounds really good. Um, do everything without complaining 
and arguing. I have a test for the 8 o'clock group. My test is the same for you. Tomorrow, as you go throughout your day, I want you to catch yourself every time that you are complaining, every time that you are arguing, and ask yourself, how easy is it to not complain and to not argue? If we're not aware of, of our attitudes and the things that we do, uh, we can never correct them. That, that would be a, an honest prayer. Lord, help me to work for you without complaint, without arguing. Don't give people a reason to criticize us. I, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, um, and the conversation gravitated towards uh, you guys, all you want is my money. And, and I said, honestly, I, I try not to ask for money if I can. You know? But the truth of the matter is everything that we do is filtered through the great commission and the great commandment. It's, it's not my money. It's God's money. And, and that is used in the reaching and teaching and growing others in the love and admonition of Christ Jesus. And that's why we do what we do. And, uh, but that's the perception. And, and I, I said to him, I said, you know, perception is reality, but it doesn't mean that it's true. But we need to be cognizant of what others think. And we need to understand that when we're presenting ourselves, that they are watching everything we do. They're watching the things we say, the things we do, the places we go, and so forth. And so Paul is saying, look, you, you want to be effective. You want to be a, a shining, bright light in this world full of crooked and perverse people, and you need to keep your focus on Christ. You know, this is a divine appointment for Philip and the Ethiopian man as the man was reading aloud from the prophet Isaiah, which is something they did back then. Uh, whether they were by themselves or they were in groups, they read aloud. I often do that in uh, my study. I, I read the Word of God. I read it out aloud. I, I, I want to hear it, you know, and, and so it's a good way of learning. But that was the, the way that they did back then. That reading silently wasn't something that was really uh, germane to that culture, but they would read aloud for those that were able to read. This was an educated man. He was able to read, and he's reading aloud from the prophet Isaiah. And uh, he acknowledged that he needed someone to explain the scripture to him. And, and I can understand that. As a matter of fact, the, the Isaiah passage, the suffering servant, has been misunderstood for a long time. But in my mind, it is a, a very clear indication of the finished work of Christ Jesus on the cross of Calvary. There's no doubt in my mind. And, uh, and I know this to be true because it's the word of God and it is exactly to a T what Christ would do. Do you know that in, in Judaism, there are portions of the Old Testament that they will not read? This is one of the passages, the suffering service, servant passage they will not read because it sounds too much like this man, Jesus, that everybody is falling all over. And, uh, you know, we know that this is a divine appointment and we know that God has sent, them, sent him there at this time uh, to be with this man. The man acknowledged his need. And, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul in Romans 10 reminds us, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Um, we're all preachers and teachers. We're all evangelists. We all have an opportunity every day to share what God has done in our lives with the, the, the hurting and the, the lost and the, the needy and the mourning among us. We can share the good news. And we're called to do that. And uh, God uses each of us in, with our own gifts and talents to share this good news you know, this was a time of, of great spiritual awakening. Uh, faithful men and women were willing to share the good news of Christ Jesus wherever they were. All right, we're, we're, we're escaping persecution, but now we have new opportunities here. Uh, I can remember being in South Korea back in 1975 and uh, having my first Christmas away from uh, family. And... Uh, 
It was uh, a difficult time, and, and yet uh, we had uh, on base at our camp uh, a, a group of uh, Korean children that came out and sang Christmas carols, and I was just so blessed by their love for Jesus and sharing. And, and I, I learned that, you know what, there's people all over the world that are praising God and loving God, and do you know why? Because somebody took the time to share the good news with them. Philip was willing to journey to Samaria to reach, to teach, to preach the good news of Christ Jesus to, to Gentiles, to, to people that they looked down on, that thought that they were somehow less than and not worthy of the love of God. But the truth is the access to God is for all people. Philip left the multitudes of people where many were being blessed to minister to this one person. He didn't even know what the assignment was. Just go. Go down this road and your next assignment is there. And, uh, and by the way, this was a desert road. And uh, if you understand anything about these desert roads back in antiquity, they were dangerous places uh, to travel alone because uh, there were people waiting you know, to rob you. Uh, there were other wild animals and things that could be harming you. And so most people would travel in groups. We uh, assume that this Ethiopian eunuch had an entourage. But he is uh, coming back from worship. And he, he is uh, filled with this joy. And he has uh, either the scroll of Isaiah or a piece of it. We don't know if it's on papaya or it's a scroll or just a piece of it. What we do know is that the word of God in this day and age was very costly to produce. And, and not everybody and their brother had a, uh, a copy of the Bible sitting on their coffee table at home. Uh, people had pieces of it. Even uh, some of the, the synagogues or the temples had portions of the scrolls, but not all of it, unless they were, were really wealthy. But this man has this, and he's reading about the suffering servant. I've always said that nothing goes to waste with God, and Philip feels no prejudice towards this man in any way, and he's been faithful to the nudging of the Holy Spirit. It reminds me of Jesus' parable of the lost sheep, where he leaves the 99 to go after the one. He sees the, the importance of not even leaving one behind, that everyone would have an opportunity to hear the news and to be cared for by the shepherd. This is why we need to be students of the word of God. If we don't know the Bible ourselves, how can we share it with others? Um, we do offer Sunday school classes and I do a Bible study on Thursday night. It is by Zoom for those of you that have computer, but we're working through the Old Testament. We're just about uh, ready to finish up the book of Genesis. And uh, one thing that I've discovered after reading through Scripture year after year is there are dots, and they connect from the old to the new, from the beginning to the end, and everywhere in between. And it is cohesive that God's plan of redemption that started in the garden is worked out through the patriarchs and through the prophets and through the apostles and ultimately the finished work of Christ Jesus on the cross of Calvary. But we need to be sensitive that, that, that Jesus is giving this parable of the importance of leaving those that are in place where they are to go after those that need to hear, that need to hear the good news. Who is the last person that you talk to about Jesus, what he's done in your life? It's a rhetorical question, but it's a, it's a question nonetheless that are we sharing our faith with others? Aren't we afraid of what people might think or what they might say? I, I'm beyond that, honestly. I, you know, for a long time it bothered me. Now I, I care more about what God thinks than what other people think. But nonetheless, every now and again, God's timing is perfect. And the person is ready, ready to receive. And uh, we just need to be ready to share in, uh, share in love and grace uh, what God has done in our own lives. We all have a story to tell. It's your story. You should know it better than anybody else. And hopefully you're able to share that with people that God places in your pathway. You know, it's God's desire that none should perish, that every soul has the opportunity to hear the good news of Christ Jesus, to receive him as their Savior and Lord, to, to understand there is a God, there is sin, and that we are sinners, that we are in need of a Savior. And that grace is sufficient for all people. 
from all times, past, present, future, until the time that, that Christ returns one day. But are we faithful? And each person has free will. We can choose. We can choose to say, I don't believe. We can choose to share or not share. Uh, we can uh, quietly worship God in, in our hearts and in our prayer closets and, and never tell another soul that we're followers of Christ. And, and by the way, you know, I know you're hurting. Let me tell you what God did for me one time when I was really hurting. If they don't want to talk to you, they're going to let you know. But we should be faithful. I'm convinced of this. Um, think back to perhaps the first person that ever shared with you about Jesus, this Lord and Savior. That would have been my nana, my grandmother on my father's side, uh, deeply loved the Lord, a, a prayer warrior, constantly praying and constantly reading and meditating on the word. And she genuinely loved people. Everywhere she went, people just seemed to gravitate towards her. I can remember being in a mall one time and, and somebody handing her a piece of bread. It was a hippie standing in the mall and they were eating bread and she walked by and said, he's here, do you would like some bread? And uh, she carried on like a 25-minute conversation with this guy over a piece of bread and she shared with him about Jesus. And I thought, how, how marvelous is that? A perfect stranger and she doesn't know. And she, uh, they break bread together and, and she shared what was near and dear in her heart. Is God near and dear in our hearts? Does it matter that Christ died a cruel death on the cross? He set us free from sin and death. He gave us the rights to be children of God. Does that matter at all? If we believe in our hearts and in our minds that Christ did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Wouldn't we want that for, for others as well? So our mission is to carry the word of God to the ends of the world and where God has placed us. Currently, God has me in Moton, where I have been blessed over the past eight years to make friends and acquaintances, to pray with people, to do funerals for people outside of the, the church and their families, to pray with people and to share the hope that I have that this is not the end of everything. As a matter of fact, this is just part of the journey that we're on heading home, that God has something so much better for us. So our mission is to carry this word to the ends of the earth. We are called by God to share the good news, to make disciples, to, to baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and to teach people to obey the word of God. Uh, we live in a world today where uh, many people that profess Jesus as Savior and Lord that, that believe in Scripture will often say, well, I don't believe in all of Scripture. I, I believe in a lot, but I don't believe in this, this, or that. And the truth of the matter is, is that it, the problem is uh, not an understanding. It's a problem of faith because I, I believe that if we have a little bit of faith, we continue to study that more will be revealed uh, we just need to be faithful to share. Uh, this eunuch has this important position as the treasurer uh, from the southern part of Egypt in the Sudan. He uh, is probably a convert to Judaism, the fact that he's going to the temple to worship, and may I say, going to great lengths. I, I was thinking about some of the people that, that worship here that travel uh, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to get here to, to worship with us. And I, I, I absolutely love that people are willing to travel a distance to come and worship. And uh, this man wanted to worship the God that he didn't fully know or understand, but he was seeking. He was reading the word and he was just waiting, waiting for the right situation. And God supplied that that day. Uh, his desire to know God uh, prompted him to travel distances to worship, and it's only uh, with, that we're truly seeking God that we'll be able to go to the lengths needed to grow in knowledge, faith, and love for God and for one another. You know, oftentimes, uh, I, I believe that every day that we have an appointment that God gives us, every day I believe that God is nudging us one way along the road to share our faith with somebody. I think every day we have an opportunity are we willing to do that? I, and I, I think that we, we need to understand that it's not on us. We just need to be faithful to share. 
If they don't receive it, they don't receive it. But I will say this, by the time anybody comes to faith in Jesus Christ, they've had many touches on their lives. We can be one of those touches that ultimately can make a difference in the lives of those that are truly seeking or, or want to know. To what length are we willing to go to grow in knowledge, faith, and love for God and for one another? I read a quote the other day, and this is not verbatim, but it basically said something like this. Do your habits and your lifestyle, do they draw you closer to God or, or do they push you further away from God? And I, I think that's an honest question. You know, James in 4.7 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Are we drawing near to God or are we just simply going along? Now, Philip asked the Ethiopian, do you understand what you're reading? And he admitted, no, I don't know. I need someone to guide me. That was a great opening question. Hearing him read and, and just asking someone, do you, do you understand? No, as a matter of fact, I don't. Can you explain this to me? That was a great segue into an opportunity to share his faith with this Ethiopian man. And uh, each of us need guidance along the way as, as we grow in faith. I have sat through, I don't know how many Bible studies and Sunday school classes over the years, and none of it's went to waste. Even this morning, we were talking about a familiar passage in Scripture, and uh, there's so much confusion surrounding that. And, but over the years, I, I've had some things that have helped me to gain a greater understanding, and then to be able to, to share that with others. Because uh, people have questions. People that don't believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord oftentimes do have questions about God and the things of God, and they're just looking for us to ask the right question as a segue to uh, begin to share with them the faith that is ours in Christ. Philip joined him in the chariot. They had a little Bible study together, and uh, this is the passage of the suffering servant from Isaiah. I'm going to share that for you. It's Isaiah 53. And uh, we know that after this encounter, the eunuch says, the Ethiopian man says, well, why shouldn't I be baptized? I'm worthy. I believe now. And there, lo and behold, there is a pool of water. They go down into the water, and Philip baptizes him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the man never sees Philip after this, but he goes away rejoicing. And, you know, I, I think about this, that we need to understand the importance and significance of baptism. You know, baptism is not just simply uh, immersing or sprinkling or, or dunking or whatever mode of baptism we're using. It is a public proclamation of an inward faith that we believe that Jesus is our our Lord and Savior. And while this was a small gathering, there was water. They got out of the carriage. They went down, and he was baptized. Uh, we know that he was grateful that, uh, that Philip had explained to him the privileges of baptism, identifying oneself with Christ in his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and, and the assurance that even now that he's interceding on our behalf, and as soon as the baptism was over, the meeting was over, and Philip was moved along to his next encounter. I'm not sure how that happened. I, I believe it's in verse 37, though. So maybe you guys can look at verse 37 in that passage and, and let me know what it says. And if you can, I'd be surprised. Uh, verse 37 is only in uh, some of the Greek manuscripts of Scripture. We do not have that in our Bible. Uh, but we do know that God was able to move Philip from place to place and uh, we know that while uh, Philip would never see uh, this Ethiopian man again, that uh, mission accomplished, that he had shared the good news and the man was ready to receive it, Philip would go to Azotus, which is Ashdod in the Old Testament. It's north of Gaza and west of Jerusalem. It's near the coast where the Caesarea by the coast is. There's another Caesarea. And that's where Philip would live for 20 years and doing the work of God. I've been blessed. Uh, to do the work of God uh, for, for many years, and for many years just kind of fumbling through it, just showing up and, and being bold and, uh, and praying and, and hoping. And uh, 
along the way, I, I've seen some fruit, and uh, I've been blessed to, to know that in small ways that God's using us to share our story that can have an impact on others. Think about somebody in your life that you need to share this good news with. I'm going to close with Isaiah 53 today. And it reads, Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sin. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. And no one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong. And he had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. And when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and intercedes for rebels. Some 800 years before the Passion, or an incarnation of Christ, may I add, that the prophet Isaiah prophesies to a T exactly what our Savior would do in this world, that he would lay down his life, that we might find true life in Christ, and that we continue to proclaim even to this day. It's my prayer that God will help us to be bolder in our faith. We don't know. We don't know what people are dealing with. And uh, you oftentimes can't read people by their, their body language or facial expressions. But God knows. If you feel that nudging, that gentle voice of God saying you need to, to share your faith with this person, follow through on it. It's God's to, to make the, the transformation. It's our job to be faithful. We were created for a purpose, and that purpose is we're on a mission from God share the good news with the lost, the hurting, needing, and each person that God has placed in our pathways, oftentimes in our own families. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your love and for your grace. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this encounter with Philip and the Ethiopian man, a, a man who would have been outside of the, the Jewish community, a, a different color, a different language perhaps. We we don't know all the specifics, but we do know, Father, that he was seeking. And we know, Father, there are many out there today that do not know what to do in their current situations. They are seeking healing from those situations. Help us to be faithful, Father, to share others with others the good news of Jesus, the lost, the hurting, and the needy among us. And uh, as far as it depends upon us, Father, may we be found faithful at your son's return one day. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Our uh, closing hymn today is hymn number 191, Father, I Adore You, 191 in your hymnal.
Please stand and join me. You know, when you love somebody, you're committed to the cause, you're willing to grow in that relationship, and you're willing to do what you need to do to be a positive part of that relationship. And, uh, you know, we have opportunities all the time, and, and I know that we fear rejection, and I know that we live in a world today that is anti-God, and that people want to reduce the Bible to simply say that God is love and we can live any way that we want to live, but there's so much more to the Word of God than just that, because all throughout Scripture, God is making a difference in the lives of those that seek Him. Let us be the catalyst for, for difference, for, for growth in the community where we're at, when you're walking your dog or you're out sitting on the porch or wherever you find yourself is always an opportunity to listen. People talk to me all the time and they say things. And I'm, I'm listening for an opportunity to share. Each of us can do that and each of us have a story to tell. We need to be willing to share that story. Turn here. I have a benediction in here. You know, I've noticed that my memory is getting worse. Now, oddly enough, I never forget to eat. It's uh, never been a problem. I... Uh, but anyway, it's uh, one of those things. Oftentimes, I'm up here and I fumble and stumble because I'm thinking of something else while I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm finding the older I get, I'm not as good at multitasking as I once was. But uh, there is a method to my madness and uh, my love for Jesus. Hopefully, that overflows into everything else that goes along with it. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and goodness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Amen and amen.